Hi, my name is Heather Scholdice, and in this video, I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit about music learning theory, or you may refer to it as the Gordon approach because it was developed by Edwin Gordon. You may hear some teachers call it the Gordon method, but this is a misnomer. A method is something that tells the teacher exactly what to teach and when to teach it, and that is not what music learning theory is. Music learning theory is just that, a theory about how we learn when we learn music. And this theory about how we learn music can be applied by any number of teachers to create an infinite number of teaching methods. In this video today, I'm going to be sharing with you two ideas that are at the heart of music learning theory. These are audiation and sequential music learning. The main focus of music learning theory is developing audiation. Audiation is a word that was coined by Edwin Gordon to mean thinking in music. Gordon based it on the word ideate, which means to have an idea or to think. He added the prefix odd, which pertains to sound, coming up with the word audiate. So if ideation means thinking, audiation means thinking in musical sounds. In fact, Gordon often uses the analogy that audiation is to music what thought is to language. Some persons mistakenly use the word audiation as a synonym for inner hearing or silently singing a song in your head. However, there is more to audiation than mere inner hearing. Audiation is the hearing and comprehension of music in the mind. To illustrate what I mean by comprehension, let's look at an example using language. Here is a recording of someone reciting a haiku in Japanese. <laughs> Let's listen again, but this time there will be silence after each line of the haiku. Try to echo the speaker during that silence. Now I'm going to play that audio again, and this time I'd like you to hear the echo silently in your mind after each line. Hopefully you were able to inner hear each line of the haiku that time. So what do those sounds mean? Unless we speak Japanese, we don't know. Even though we could inner hear the sounds, we had no comprehension of those sounds. Similarly, you can inner hear music without comprehension of the sounds you are inner hearing. This comprehension that happens when we audiate music involves a sense of tonal and rhythmic syntax. We know that language has syntax, the normal arrangement of words and phrases into sentences. This like don't talk we. It was probably difficult for you to discern that I just tried to say we don't talk like this because I didn't use proper syntax. We develop this sense of language syntax not by being formally taught, but by hearing a lot of language and beginning to experiment with our own speech skills. Similarly, by hearing and interacting with a great deal of music, we begin to develop a sense of tonal syntax and rhythmic syntax. For example, If you were audiating tonally, you could sense that what I just played sounded unfinished. Even if you had never studied music theory or had never learned the labels tonic, dominant, or subdominant, if you sense that the music wanted to go back to, you were demonstrating some degree of tonal audiation. This brings us to the third point I'd like to make about audiation, and that is that it involves prediction. Again, let's use language as an example. As you're listening to me speak, you're recognizing and processing my speech sounds, thinking about what I'm saying, relating it to your prior knowledge or experiences, and if you're truly understanding me, you're probably able to predict what I'm about to, did you think say? The same thing happens musically when we're audiating. When you listen to a piece of music, you process the musical sounds you're hearing, make sense of them through the context of music you've heard in the past, and if you're audiating, you should be able to make a prediction about where the music might go next. Let's try a little experiment. I'm going to sing a little tune that has four short phrases, but instead of singing the fourth phrase, I would like you to make up an ending to my song. Let's try it. Here 
is my song. Ba dum ba dum ya da dum bum. Ba dum ba dum ya da dum bum. Ba dum ba da dum ba dum ya da dum bum bum. Were you able to make up an ending to my song? If not, rewind and try again. If you were able to make up an ending to my song, what enabled you to make up that ending that would make musical sense? Did I explicitly tell you what meter or what tonality my song was in and that you should be in that same meter and tonality? Did I tell you that my song ended on the dominant function and that you should start your ending on the dominant function and end on the tonic? Obviously I didn't, but if you were audiating, you probably imposed those restrictions on yourself, either consciously or subconsciously, by using your audiation to make tonal and rhythmic sense of what I was doing. Now there is much more to audiation than this. Gordon theorizes about a number of types and stages of audiation, which you can read about in his book, Learning Sequences in Music. For now, I hope the basic definition of audiation I have shared has helped you begin to understand the concept. Another big idea at the heart of music learning theory is that of sequential learning. Gordon theorizes that we learn music and language through parallel processes. Think about the process through which we learn our native language when we are born. Pause this video for a moment and try to call to mind the various steps that a young child typically takes in learning to become fluent and literate in his or her native language. Maybe you identified babbling as the first step to learning one's native language. However, something critical happens even before we begin to babble. We listen. When we are first born, we begin learning our native language by being immersed in a rich language environment. As a baby hears people speak to her or around her, she becomes acculturated to the sounds of her native language and develops a listening vocabulary. Next, we begin to develop our speaking vocabularies by experimenting with the language sounds we have been hearing. Most children begin with babbling, making sounds that are similar to language but are not understandable to others. This is because children in the babble stage typically don't yet realize that the sounds they are making don't match the language sounds in the environment. So we simply continue to speak to and interact with the child until she breaks that language code and speaks her first word. As she develops her speaking vocabulary, the child also learns to think in language, to use language sounds to communicate thought, and to have spontaneous conversations with others. Only after developing fluency in these language skills do we expect a child to read and write. And when we do learn to read and write, we start by learning to read and write familiar words. After we can read and write a number of familiar words, we begin to learn how to figure out unfamiliar words. And much later, we learn about the theory behind how language is put together, such as parts of speech. Gordon theorizes that we learn music through a parallel process. We begin learning our native music by being immersed in a rich music environment. As a baby hears people sing or chant to her or around her, she becomes acculturated to the sounds of her native music and develops a musical listening vocabulary. Next, we begin to develop our musical speaking vocabularies by experimenting with the music sounds we have been hearing. This musical speaking vocabulary includes singing, chanting, moving our bodies to music, and possibly even experimenting with playing instruments by ear. Most children begin with music babble, making sounds that are similar to music but don't yet make musical sense. This is because children in the music babble stage typically don't yet realize that the sounds they're making don't match the music sounds in the environment. So we simply continue to sing and chant to and interact musically with the child until she breaks that music code and begins to sing in tune and chant and move rhythmically. Then, just as we develop a vocabulary of words, we develop a vocabulary of tonal patterns and rhythm patterns. As a child develops her musical speaking vocabulary, she also learns to think in music, to use musical sounds to communicate thought, and to have spontaneous musical conversations with others. In other words, audiating and improvising. Only after developing fluency in these musical skills should we expect a child to read and write music. And when we do learn to read and write music, we should begin by learning to read and write familiar tonal patterns and rhythm patterns. After we can read and write a number of familiar tonal and rhythm patterns, we can begin learning how to figure out unfamiliar patterns, and much later, we can learn about the theory behind how music is put together. 
Gordon expanded upon this idea of sequential learning to create his skill learning sequence, which outlines two different types of learning and a variety of skill levels within each. You can learn more about this by reading his book, Learning Sequences in Music, or by visiting the website of the Gordon Institute for Music Learning at www.giml.org. I would like to close with one more concept that is central to music learning theory, and that is aptitude. All human beings can learn to audiate and develop musical skills because we're all born with some amount of music aptitude, the potential to achieve in music. Therefore, it is our duty as music educators to help all of our students turn that aptitude into music achievement by developing musical skills and understanding, thereby enabling and empowering all of our students to go on to a lifetime of independent music making and music learning.